Autism is considered a developmental disorder and has been estimated to occur in about 1-2% to of the population. While the number of people with autism in any given population is low, based on reporting by less than reputable sources, it would appear that there is an autism epidemic. However, this does not appear to be the case. But saying so does not diminish the physical, emotional, and financial toll those with autism and caregivers may experience. For this reason, researchers have sought to better understand autism and create interventions. And the brain appears to play a key role in the development and manifestation of autism. So let's look at what is known about autism. But before we do, make sure to subscribe to this channel and click the bell so that you never miss an episode about that thing in your head. No, not the internal voice that continues to stab you in the rib cage, twist the knife, and runs off laughing. It's not funny, Kennedy. It kind of is, though. Anyways, back to the brain. Again, we're discussing and looking at autism, and I've got some things to say about people that contribute to the research. Um, but I'm going to say that at the end, so just stick around for a bit and kind of walk this journey with me through autism in the brain. For all that is known about autism, there is so much we don't yet know, like the cause of autism remains unknown, but researchers have identified some risk factors. For instance, 10% of children with chromosomal disorders or other genetic disorders also have autism. Complicating people's general understanding of autism is the fact that there are differing levels of severity regarding this developmental disorder. But there are some similarities among people with autism compared to those who do not have autism. You may have heard of autism, Asperger's, high-functioning autism, or low-functioning autism. These terms are utilized to describe the wide range of variability found within the autistic community. But they are not clinical or diagnostic terms. They either used to be and are now outdated, or they never were diagnostic terms in the first place. Instead, the clinical term is Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, and this clinical identifier is used to describe behavioral patterns seen within this patient population. Those patterns include social communication and interaction difficulties, repetitive behaviors, and narrow interests. Some individuals with autism may have minimal impairments, so much so that they will not be diagnosed until well into adulthood or possibly never even receive a diagnosis. These individuals slip through the cracks due to a variety of reasons. One reason may be due to the common misconception that those with autism experience intellectual impairments. The truth is, is that nearly half of all children with ASD have average or above average levels of intelligence. Thus, intellectual ability is not a defining feature of autism. Behavioral features such as impairments in social interaction are the primary way in which ASD is understood and diagnosed. However, we are becoming closer to reaching a point in which features of the brain may be integrated in diagnosing and classifying ASD. Such features are both structural, the formation of brain parts, and functional, the way in which brain cells and parts of the brain interact with each other. Let us look at potential brain abnormalities in ASD. A mostly consistent finding are patterns of age-specific brain overgrowth, meaning that areas of the brain appear larger than they should at specific ages of development. Patterns of overgrowth have been documented in children ages 2 to 6 years old and are localized to frontal and temporal cortical areas. These two brain areas deal with a lot of things, so I don't think it would be accurate to state that these brain areas are definitively tied to specific behaviors in autism. Instead, it would be more accurate to suggest that autism may be a large-scale brain disorder that impacts how one perceives and interacts with their environment. Another area of the brain that appears to display overgrowth during these ages is the amygdala. The amygdala is the epicenter of emotion, or core emotional processing, area of the brain. Further, this area of the brain has been linked to the severity of symptoms in autism. Altogether, abnormal early patterns of cortical overgrowth impact brain regions responsible for the development of social, emotion, 
language, and communication abilities. Overgrowth of brain areas indicate an excess number of brain cells. What is currently understood about how our brain cells come about is that our brain cells, specifically neurons, generate during prenatal development. And we may not grow new neurons after birth. For instance, researchers have looked at postmortem brains of toddlers with and without autism and have discovered excess number of neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex compared to those without autism. Thus, this allows us some insight into when the development of autism may occur during prenatal growth. During mid to late childhood, the overgrowth period does slow or even stop. It is during this period that brain growth of those without autism accelerates. So we're seeing a, a reversal. Those with autism decelerate during this time, those without autism accelerate. Neurodegeneration or loss of brain cells and cortical thickness has been documented in autism during adolescence and adulthood. What may account for the deceleration of brain cell growth and even loss of cells and cortical thickness documented in autism is that the overgrowth and excess neurons could cause dysfunction in how brain cells communicate with each other. What we've got here is failure to communicate. So in an attempt to improve cellular connectivity, a corrective mechanism is triggered that prunes the excess or gets rid of the excess axon connections that are present due to the excess number of neurons in hopes that this will improve neural circuit functioning. This corrective remodeling may be responsible for neural inflammation, which is swelling of brain tissue, documented in some adolescents and young adults with autism. However, neural inflammation can be a sign of a whole host of brain events, including trauma. In addition to brain structural abnormalities are brain functional differences regarding cellular activity that lead to dysfunction. Some dysfunctions impact entire neural networks. Neural networks are a cluster of neurons that work together to bring about some process. For instance, researchers have looked at a core network associated with mentalizing, a process by which we attempt to understand motives, desires, and beliefs of others. A defining feature of autism is social and communication difficulties, and some researchers argue that this difficulty arises due to a failure in mentalizing. Just for a frame of reference, I'm going to name brain parts. This core mentalizing network includes the paracingulate cortex, which is housed within the medial prefrontal cortex, the temporal parietal junction, and the temporal poles. Long story short, there may be some dysfunction in this network as studies have shown decreased or absent activation of the network during mentalizing tasks in those studied with autism. There are other areas of the brain that show different patterns of activity. Sometimes the areas are hyperactive, sometimes they're underactive. There is an abundance of literature on this, and I don't have enough time to address all of it, but I did want to specifically address the mentalizing network, as it was interesting to me. I'll include articles in the description box below that know other areas of the brain that may show functional irregularities in autism for your reading pleasure. One thing I want to address, and this goes beyond investigating autism specifically, is that at the end of the day regarding brain research, nothing is set in stone. Science evolves and the tools we utilize improve, which means there is a lot we don't yet know about how our brains work. So keep that in mind when encountering this kind of research. Also, whenever I talk about conditions or disorders such as autism, I want you to keep in mind that we are discussing brains of real people living with conditions that often impact their lives on a regular, if not daily, basis. The entire goal of trying to better understand brains of people with certain conditions is so we are able to treat symptoms, side effects, or anything else that exists in which patients and even caregivers identify as being problematic. Ultimately, none of this research would exist if it weren't for the patients and healthy participants who have sacrificed their time to participate in research studies or have even donated their brains to science. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all of those study participants, past and present, who have added to our knowledge and understanding of how we humans work. And at that, I will note that if you've made it this far and haven't selected that subscribe button, I have to wonder, what are you waiting for? It takes a few seconds. And make sure to select the bell too.
that's the best way to be notified about a new episode. If you know someone in your life who enjoys this kind of content, feel free to share this video. And if you enjoyed watching, click that like button. It'll help me feel good about myself, I guess. <laughs> also, also, if you want to support my channel with big brainiac energy, then head on over to my Patreon page to become a contributing member or go to PayPal to submit a one-time donation. As always, thank you for feeding your brain with brief brain snacks.